Hello and welcome to Quadcast, Quadrant Chambers weekly discussion programme. We are four barristers from London. That is me, Paul Downs, Poonam Mawani, Joe Sullivan and Claudia Wilmot-Smith. And we gather each week, 5pm on YouTube, Thursday live, to talk about law, argue and everybody else to come round to my point of view by the end of the programme. And so the format's very simple. We're going to talk about a legal topic this week. It's liquidated damages. And we have a drink. I've got a delicious cup of tea, as usual. And we chat. And we want you to chat. We want you to join in. So you can email us. That's quadcast at quadrantchambers.com. Or if you're watching on YouTube and you're subscribed and signed in, you can chat along on the uh, YouTube chat function. So let's do some catch up and some news. Uh, let's go to Joe first. What, what have you been up to this week? I've been hard at it this week. I've been, I've got a trial coming up. I've been doing a skeleton argument and um, I'm punching the same. I'm, I'm juniorring for this silk who is... I hear the very learned erudite silk, isn't he? I was going to say sort of Dickensian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Um, What's it, what is the trial for? His name is Paul, Paul Dick. No, is that too obvious? P down. I hear he's the greatest advocate. Guys, how is your trial happening? How's your trial happening? Is it remote, hybrid? hybrid. What's going on? Hy hybrid, yeah. Hybrid, part petrol, part electric. Right. Who's next? Claudia. Claudia. I'm the opposite. I had two settlements this week. So I had the opportunity to catch up on legal developments around the world. I'm sure everyone's aware this afternoon, East Court time, Happy the Elephant suit is going to be heard. She's sued for a hebus corpus in the Brit Bronx. Um, Happy the Elephant has sued, asking to be released from a zoo in the Bronx <laughs> to an elephant sanctuary. Um, and I, I saw this with great interest because I did a case about five years ago where I was representing HSBC, who were being sued by two dogs, Goldie and Diamond, uh, for millions of pounds for damages for breach of the Human, uh, Human Rights Act. Uh, I'm not making a representation <laughs> or were they litigants in person? Uh, they, were, they were named on the claim form, um, Goldie, Diamond, uh, Mrs. Moosen and her children. Uh, they were struck out. <laughs> I, I had a real problem. I was going through the white book seeing if there was anything saying defining a person to try and say that a dog wasn't a person. In the end, I just said, a dog isn't a person. <laughs> I didn't accept my submission. Well so hopefully, Happy the Elephant's case will um, go the other way. But um, anyone wants any, any, any animal-based cases, I'm, I'm really the person to go to. Brunam, <laughs> have you been doing such a cases? <laughs> um I'm not sure mine's as exciting as yours. Well, as you all know, um, last Friday and the weekend was Diwali, Indian New Year. And it was a bit rubbish because instead of having 50, 60, 70 people here like I would normally, it was just half my family. But Diwali is Festival of Lights and it's really traditional to have fireworks. So notwithstanding it just being four of us, I got lots of fireworks in and got my son, Nick, to set them off. And I've got a little video to show you. Ben? So this is Nick lighting the last one. See ya. Right, hold on. So you heard us all see you. It still hasn't left. And now the end of the clip, please, Ben. Yikes. It just exploded in all our faces, went everywhere. Nick got lots of burns. It didn't take off. Guys, don't do fireworks at home. Not a good idea. Well, you should have warned that people of a nervous disposition shouldn't watch that because <laughs> Claudia's obviously <laughs> had to leave. Are there any animals weeks? were hurt in the filming of that production. Are there any so, weeks where you don't get that? I had two settlements, two boxes of papers just arrived. Apologies for <laughs> the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Paul. How, how long did it take you to set that one up, Claudia, just to show <laughs> okay. us you've got a practice? Yeah. Right, okay. I it's have got... Important dog base practice. I've got something new for you all, never before on Quadcast. I've got a quiz. So this is for everybody watching. Um, and you three mustn't... It, you can... Don't, don't, don't say the answer out loud if you know the answer. Okay. So what we've got here 
I'm going to personally put up a bottle of champagne, okay? So once you get the answer on this, if you're watching uh, on YouTube, email the answer to quadcast at quadrantchambers.com and the first person to send in the right answer, I will send a bottle of champagne to them, okay? Can so, I email and, too? I'm really compassionate. Can, okay. can I email too? Can okay, I, I don't think you three it people... Uh, it's got, it, no... No, I think it's got to be a, a viewer. But okay. you have to send in your name and the address you want the champagne to go to. Okay, so uh, do that. Now, Ben, can we put up the image? We're going to put it up as a slide. Okay, so what it is, is uh, something links the three pictures. Okay, a word links the three pictures. And that word appears in one of the cases we're going to be talking about today. So what you've got to do is find the word, find the case, and then I want you to send me the paragraph number that's got the word in. And let me just tell you what the pictures are. So in the top left, it's easy. Stop moaning, honestly. Top left is Dennis Strachwalerzy, in his Everton strip. Joe, that one's for you. Top right is the Cybo flower, C-E-I-B-O. Uh, bottom left is the month of July, 1816. Okay, so something links those three. And you've got to try and work out what the thing is that links the three and then link it to one of the cases we're going to talk about today and then send me the paragraph number of the in the judgment that that word appears in have you all got that that sounds horrifically complicated well i might have but to simplify it if we do it again campaign from paul downs i can tell you he has so find the word working out see it's really easy claudia honestly uh find the word <laughs> that links the three pictures then find the case then find the word in the case and then send me the paragraph number in the judgment that the word appears in so okay the email that they sent to pull downs or to quadcast says the paragraph from the case all you got to send is the number yeah pa to okay. quadcast at quadrantchambers.com that email again quadcast <laughs> at quadrantchambers.com it looks like you know actually, looking... happen? actually no one is going to pay attention to anything we now say in this webinar or whatever well, look, i don't know I, the way you're all looking at this out talk about our the way you're all okay. looking at me completely mystified. I think my champagne's safe, don't you? Okay. What are we doing now? We're talking about liquidated damages. I'm introducing the topic. So liquidated damages. So uh, two parties to a contract, they agree that one of the parties is going to do something. If that party doesn't, obviously the other party can claim damages at large. The monetary sum to put them in the position that they would be had the breach not occurred. But in many contracts, you have a clause which provides for a monetary sum to be paid instead of damages being at large, the party's estimate of those damages. But I think, Joe, I'm right in saying oh, this, that's not a debt. There's, there's a difference, isn't there, between liquidated damages and a debt? Yeah, there are important differences between damages and debt claims. Um, it all really comes back to the difference between primary and secondary obligations. And the, the clearest exposition of that difference is Lord Diplock's speech in the Photo Productions and Securicor case back in 1980. Um, hang on, hang on a minute, Joe. Are you telling me that a case that I learned about at uni is still good law? Because all I've learned from podcast is the law keeps changing. So still good for the production? Yeah, that, deg that degree is still doing, doing you well. <laughs> yeah, so, I think that was before you were born, wasn't it? It was before, I, even, before even I was born. Long before, I was, before I was born as well, yeah, mind you. Before you were born, yeah, yeah. Before, before you were reborn. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, it was um, uh, Lord Diplock's speech and, and Lord Wilberforce a bit, but it was um, Lord Diplock explained that where you have a contract, the parties make promises, uh, and those are the primary, well, principally, those are the primary obligations if you promise to do something or not to do it. Uh, and then if you breach a primary obligation, if you fail to comply with your contractual covenant, 
then that can give rise to secondary obligations, which the law imposes. Uh, one of those secondary obligations can be an obligation to pay damages. Um, and so uh, a debt, by contrast, is a primary obligation because that will be where someone promises to pay someone else an amount of money and their failure to do that gives rise to a debt. It's the I mean, I've, I've always been an admirer of this analysis, the primary and secondary obligation analysis, but was that Lord Diplock's own analysis or did he get it from some other case? Does it... it uh, Everybody talks about it being the dip-locking analysis. But well, in, in photo productions, he does cite previous authority on the point, but it's, it's him. So he cites himself <laughs> when he's Lord Justice <laughs> Diplock, and, and Wilberforce think, cites him too. Um, I, think, I think it I must think be older than that. I mean, maybe not in that language, but the, the, sort of, the nature of the analysis must be older. But he, if it is, he's not giving it up in that case. It's all. Yeah, I think the nature of the analysis is, but I do think it was Diplock who introduced this terminology that has made it much yeah. more widely understood. Um, I think, Joe, what are the main differences, though, between. Well, the debt and you have the practical debt. differences because, so for example, if you bring a claim in debt, you've got no duty to mitigate, whereas you do have a duty to mitigate where you're seeking damages. Um, but how like, can I ask when you're seeking liquidated damages do you have a duty to mitigate um when you're seeking liquidated damages i don't think you do have a duty to mitigate no i don't think you can because you've agreed it right so you have no it's duty to minimize it well hang on a minute what about if it's for delay and you could limit the delay by acting reasonably to mitigate the delay surely that you might have that might you fair um, point possibly i mean would you deal with is, it, is that mitigation in that case or or do they deal with it as causation i'm not Who sure knows? But anyway, and for damages claims, you can't bring a claim for late payment of damages. You can't say, I've suffered damage because you failed to pay me damages sooner. Yeah. But you can bring a claim for special damages for a failure to pay a debt on time in certain circumstances. And in any event, the Parliament has legislated for commercial debts for, for there to be a, um, a remedial response to that by way of interest and, and compensation. Um, so those are really the differences. But what, why are liquidated damages important, Claudia? Before I get to that, I want to call out Eleanor Diaz for her exceptional taste in champagne. Ruinard Blanc de Blanc is very good. I don't know if that's what Paul is sending. Um, <laughs> Eleanor, I, I did see that Eleanor on the chat. I saw that on the chat. Eleanor, if you <laughs> get the that. answer right, it may yeah. be a Ruinard Blanc de Blanc coming to you. But work on the answer. Um. But yes, no, so liquidated damages are, well, as Poonam says, you don't have to work out difficult questions of causation, um, with mitigation, or the, proving your loss can be really difficult. And in lots of industries where party A is to perform particular work within a set period or by a deadline or in accordance with a schedule, and party B will suffer loss if that work is not done in time or is delayed, it's super common to liquidate damages for that delay, either at a fixed rate or by reference to a formula. Um, and parties are probably more likely to agree a genuine pre-estimate of loss in advance of the contract than they are to agree quantum, right, by the time everyone's fallen out. So it's in charter parties and uh, voyage charter parties and associated commodities contracts, uh, I'm probably not the only person in Quadrant Chambers who has spent a lot of time since COVID dealing with demarrage delays because obligations to discharge, uh, you might think that you're going to discharge in three days and then a port has shut down. And so you have to pay the ship owner damages for delay, which are liquidated at what we call the demarrage rate because we love jargon. Uh, building contracts, the standard JCT forms uh, include liquidated damages for delay. Um, and... I think the extra, uh, in these extraordinary times is, I think, the stop phrase these days, uh, everything stopped, right? So in April, Barber ABI identified over 4,200 UK construction projects with a combined value of almost £68 billion pounds that had been delayed as a result of COVID. And damages for delay are commonly liquidated. So liquidated damages provisions in contracts in huge industries. Okay, but uh, well, hold on, hold on. Liquidated damages don't just come up in these sexy, all expensive areas. I seem to recall that 25 years ago, there was a case 
where there was a liquidated damages clause for failure to return a library book to the library on time. And um, this library was so upset that their books were never returned. That it was like £25 a day. What were talking about it? Why? Dipped with library charges. A fiver paperback, you, you, you return it two months later and they say this will be 500,000. I'm exaggerating, but yeah. That would be so, a catch so, though. So this damages are still subject to the penalty, law of penalties, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so this, this episode of Quadcast, we've got a $10 trillion construction industry worldwide, depending on it. We've got the billions in the shipping industry. And what's more, the return of library books hangs on this on what we're going to say here yeah the industries that on which the uk economy relies are yeah, all covered. These pillars of the global well, economy given i've got three kids at uni who are probably not returning their books on time quite important to me <laughs> <laughs> so Poonam, the, but the que the question is or one of the questions that arises is if you've got a claim for liquidated damages can you get other damages on top quite uh, and this is the eternal bliss which uh, in the shipping world that with discussed this recently that as claudia mentioned voyage charters you have a, a period in which you load or discharge and if you exceed that then you have to pay demurrage and the really interesting thing is i'm sure claudia was just speaking colloquially but she said demurrage is your liquidated damages for delay well not quite um the real question with the eternal bliss and in every case you have to look at is what is your liquidated damages liquidating? Right. Uh, and yeah. sometimes the contract makes it really clear and sometimes it doesn't. It, in voyage charters, it just says demurrage. So you need to go back and say, well, what is, the, what is demurrage? So let me, let me give you a clear way of how it, arise in the, it arises in the shipping world. So the ship's delayed. There's the loss of its income as a freight earning unit, you know, what it would be able to earn notionally on the market if it was free. And it's not able to do that because it's stuck in the port because of delay. Then imagine that the delay means that this vessel's been stuck there in tropical waters, so she's got lots of hull fouling, and it's going to cost lots of money to fix that hull fouling. That's also been caused by delay. And just one more example before I bore you all silly with my shipping cases is, um, imagine the cargo on board is something that has a limited ship shelf life and it's going to go off because of delay even however much you look after it so in the eternal bliss it was soya beans that sprouted no caked and molded um and went off so there's um, so, so the big question was well one obligation has caused various heads of loss yeah the only obligation that was breached uh, and this was one of the issues the only obligation that was breached was they failed to discharge the cargo in the promised number of days and the argument was well you've agreed to demur demurrage is your liquidated damages for delay that's the end of it you can't claim uh, the cargo damage and what the judge held was no demurrage you need to work out what is the liquidated damage from in the shipping world demurrage is the loss of your vessel as a freight earning unit uh, so you can claim these other things uh, subject to but, isn't that, but don't you i mean it just seems to me there's the risk of double recovery there because don't you have to take the rough with the smooth? If you say so take an example where the ship is delayed and uh, in fact there is no available market to to uh, charter out the ship alternatively, so there is in fact no loss. You get your demurrage anyway because that's the liquidated damages, and then you claim loss on top of that. It just seems to be wrong. Well, no, hold on, it's not double recovery if you get your loss even though there's no market that's just the consequence of you guys having done your general pre-estimate um, which you've done to know your abilities you know your possible liabilities but to take your example let's say then when there is no market your hull fouling you're cleaning your hull then you'd get the cost of cleaning the hull but you wouldn't get the loss of your vessel while that was being cleaned because there is no market for it because that's not caught by the demurra trade. That's quite an interesting problem. I might put, yeah, but so no, I don't think it's double recovery. Once you've 
decided what the, sh- the, the rate is liquidating. But is it, yeah, is I think it, your issue, Paul, is an issue with liquidated gen- damages in general, right? Because markets move, so you could be very overcompensated or very under. No, I, I think mine is that I would strain to try and reach the position whereby the parties had wrapped up all of the losses arising from that breach. Obviously, different breaches, that would be another matter. But I would I would strain to say that all of the losses arising from that breach are covered by the liquidated damages. Okay, sorry, I don't get I get I get the straining to say that all delay losses are covered by the I get that. But then it shouldn't matter if there's different breaches, because I think you've agreed that that figure is the liquidated agreed amount for those type, and then it shouldn't matter how many breaches you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what I meant was, if you, it wouldn't preclude you saying that there's some other breach. So, for example, the ship wasn't seaworthy or something like that. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Anyway, um, this is Paul trying to prove he's a shipping lawyer by using fancy words like scout, seaworthy. Spare me your spare me your school child. Right, well, let, let's move on to fitness. an area you're comfortable with. How, how, I want to know: point? Is it going to the court of appeal? Is oh, sorry. Like, yeah, so, oh, yes, plug to Chambers. Tom Bird of Chambers was on the um, successful side that won this case, it, um, uh, overturning other first instance authority, and it is a really thorny area. So Miss Justice Andrew Baker gave permission to appeal. Uh, he said he was quite certain he was right and he would be upheld, but nonetheless, because there'd been lots of conflicting authorities, well, and lots of books taking different positions. It would be good to have the Court of Appeal authoritatively stamp their approval on his judgment. So uh, watch this space. My personal view is the appeal should fail and that Tom got it right. Okay. Um, but we're waiting for the Supreme Court on other things, right, Paul? Well, this is triple point technology. Let me just explain the facts of this case. Triple point were an American Delaware company specializing in software, and they contracted with a a Thai company, PTT public company, to write some software for commodity trading. The PTT were involved in trading commodities. The contract was $6.92 million. And the idea was that the software would be delivered in nine phases. And as the software was delivered, they would get paid a percentage of the $6.92 million. It didn't go terribly well. Uh, a triple point delivered phase one but that was 149 days late and they didn't deliver phases two to nine um some some might think uh, rather uh, boldly they nonetheless claimed payment of all the sums that were owing to them even though they hadn't delivered the software and perhaps unsurprisingly ptt refused to pay i don't know whether triple point had particularly aggressive American lawyers, but they weren't slow. So they then issued proceedings claiming uh, payment in debt on the invoices. And uh, PTT defended and said, we're not paying because you haven't delivered the software. And PTT counterclaimed. And there was a liquidated damages provision in the agreement. And they counterclaimed for the loss, the liquidated damages for the delay on phase one, but also liquidated damages for the other phases where there'd been nothing had delivered and they claim those damages up to the point of termination of the contract and the judge at first instance mrs justice jefford she awarded all of it so she awarded liquidated damages for the phase that was delivered late and liquidated damages for phases two to nine that weren't delivered so hang on, hang on. sorry paul maybe i wasn't didn't pick it up but so what was unusual about here Liquidated damages is common. Was it here? What the contract was terminated uh, while the fa- at some point? Yeah. By um, the innocent party claiming the liquidated damages. Yeah. So I mean, the the the, the parties broke down because. Triple Point were trying to get the money and PTT were refusing. But the result of that was the contract was terminated. Okay. So there was this whole thing of do you get liquidated damages up to the completion of the task or do you get them up to termination or do you get them indefinitely? Or not at all if it's or, terminated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that was one, the first one. <laughs> um, so it went to the Court of Appeal, Joe, didn't it? Yeah, so the lead, lead judgment was Sir Rupert Jackson and uh, Lord Justice Floyd and Lord Justice Lewison agreed with him. He, um, well, he began by 
criticizing, not criticizing perhaps, but noting that none of the relevant authorities have been cited to Mrs. Justice Jefford. And none of the relevant authorities, he said, were cited to the Court of Appeal on the first day of the appeal. Which so imagine... would you read it looks terrible council work almost. Yeah, but you can't you but... can't win. I mean, Puno, I don't want to steal your thunder, but there was a bit of it was the other way in the Supreme yeah, Court. Yeah, I was gonna say it? I'm not sure they were relevant. Well, they're not irrelevant. The case is about construction, but yeah, Paul, what you're referring to, I think, is what happened in the Supreme Court, which by the way was heard earlier this month, was really early on in the appellate's arguments. He's looking at the cases having been shouted at by um, the Court of Appeal for not giving them the authority. And Lord Leggett says, Well, why don't you have the courage of your convictions? And why don't He had a smile on his face, Poonam. He does, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm being stroppy, Judge, but you're right. He did have a smile. Um, you're quite right. So, Joe, having been ticked off, how did they do in the Court of Appeal then? So, so then Sir Rupert Jackson went through a number of these cases and I identified the point that balls foreshadowed. That you, you could have a situation where the clause just doesn't apply at all if the work isn't done. You could have a situation where the clause applies up to the date of termination but then no further. Or you could, you could have a situation where the clause applies even after the contract is terminated up until, say, an alternative contractor completes the work that the first contractor failed to do. And he found authorities that had adopted all three of those approaches. But in the end, he said, well, it's a matter of construction on the facts of the case, since the work wasn't done at all, uh, this is a case where the liquidated damages clause just didn't apply. There wasn't a, a delay. It was just non-performance. And so you can't claim liquidated damages, but you can claim general damages um, I I instead. So that was, the, that was the outcome in the course of appeal. But what's going to happen next? But actually, just thinking about what you just said, Joe, I mean, it's a huge, huge consequence, right? So the, the innocent person terminates the contract because the other side are taking forever and they're in repudiatory, renunciatory breach, whatever else is going on. They've got this liquidated damages clause. Yeah, they, they, they just want their liquidated damages up to the date of termination. But if, as, as the Court of Appeal said, you can't claim them at all, suddenly they've got to prove all their loss, which may be very difficult to prove, and what they thought they had gets ripped away. I mean, if that stays, if that is your situation, you need to think really carefully when you terminate because you could be losing all this money for want of proof of your real damages. And if, the other, and if it's the other way around, uh, if the judge was right, you're, you might want to just hang around and not, not terminate for a while. Let the, let the liquid damages clock up for a bit. Yeah. I mean, possibly the answer to all of this will be you just need to make sure your clause does what you, what you want it to do. But, um, I, I love this. We all keep saying... It all depends on it. But you just, you, you, poor contracting parties, they can't legislate for all of this. We need a little bit of... So, Supreme Court, the way the argument's gone, we obviously don't have the judgment yet. As I said, it was just a couple of weeks ago, the argument. Um, really, the essential way the argument went was this. Is the... You've got the breach. Everyone says that there's been this breach. They haven't delivered by delay. But is the agreement that there will be liquidated damages, has that right to the liquidated damages accrued? Does it accrue day by day for every day of delay? So that you could sue after four days of delay, if you like. Or does it only accrue at the end when you actually accept the vessel, when the project's over? And the respondent's case is that day doesn't happen where there's a termination. You never reach the point of completion. Or alternatively, in the middle, do you say that it's been that the right has accrued, but that the the accrual is subject to a condition subsequent whereby the right is disappears if you don't get to termination? I mean, everyone accepts that if you have accrued rights, they don't go away when you terminate, right? That, that they're accrued. But the question was, has it accrued? What's the party's bargain? And is it subject to a condition subsequent? And that's really how the argument went. 
Um, I've watched quite a lot of it because I watched it today because I took a day off work and spent a day on podcast to learn something new. I know what I think the right answer and what's going to happen is, should we have a little vote around? Claudia, you've been unusually quiet for you, honey. What do you think is or should be the right answer? I think... On this contract required certain work to be done by a certain time. And I think that obligation was breached on the day it should have been done. And therefore the right to claim damages for breach of that obligation accrues on that date and damages are thereafter liquidated. And I think accrue day by day. I think there may be another contract where the obligation is to complete the work. And if you don't complete it, you haven't... Uh, but if you have and you've done it late, then you get dam delay damages, which is kind of Sir Rupert Jackson's analysis. But I don't think his analysis fit with the contractual scheme he was considering. So I think... Okay. All right. Boys, who wants to go next? Jeff? I think... Well, I, I disagree. I, I mean, I agree with the first part of that analysis, but I think that the, on the wording of this, the contract in this case that isn't what was being liquidated it was a, it was quite it seems to me on the language it was a delay not a non-performance forever it was a delay that was being liquidated so you think no. but that mean but that means the obligation is this super art, supervening obligation to complete rather than by a particular time whereas i think this was going to the time when you no to i do don't think it does mean that i think it just means that 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 is what they have decided to liquidate and it doesn't mean that you can't claim damages. You get your general damages. But you just don't know. So you may or may not have a right at a particular period in time and you won't find out until a later date. Yeah. You, it's you, not until later that you find out. Whether because it's impossible for you to know, to, to liquidate those damages. So, okay. you know so I just don't know whether I've got a right or not. Until I, later. See, I thought... I didn't watch as much as Poonam. I only watched the morning session. Because you probably had some work to do today, so don't feel bad for. Just lost the will to live. Mm -hmm. I thought that they were a bit hostile to, in the morning to the appellant, so I thought the appeal was going to be dismissed. I See, what I think it is that there comes a point when the mechanism breaks down. If you've got a situation where the software is just never delivered or the building's never delivered, that mm -hmm. whole mechanism it just isn't designed for that and so therefore i think you move out of that regime into a damages at large regime and that will be just a question of fact and maybe construction so well i know we need to do the case study, but just uh, although i'm on claudia's side as to the outcome of the appeal claudia of course one of the problems with liquidated damages and these sort of contracts is actually you don't ever know whether you're going to get how much you're going to get because it's always subject to um, you get it unless caused by delay on the other side and everyone's always arguing yeah. about whether the other side's delay. So you, it's not like it's one of those things that's bird in the hand. You literally never do know till you end up in court, frankly. But that's a different point, right? That's not knowing the what ha on the facts that have occurred up until today, what was the cause of where we are today. Whereas in this case, Joe's solution is saying, we do not know where we are today and it will not be known until okay. something else has happened later. All right, I accept and that. And I don't think that my no. position today can be determined by reference to a future event. Okay. Now, let me, let me just, before, we'll, just, we'll do the case study in a moment, but just let me, we've had a question, um, which is, I don't understand why liquidated damages are not a debt. Um, I, th I suspect this question won't, won't be a loan because it is quite difficult to explain or to justify why one sort of contractual provision to pay money, which is term liquidated damages, is a damages claim, and another contractual obligation to pay money not headed up liquidated damages is a debt. But there's no reason in principle. It just is because it is, isn't it? I mean... Well, it's because, yeah. isn't it, that the if it's liquidated damages, the, the triggering event for the payment is a breach of, an, of yeah. another primary obligation. That's the conceptual, I agree. It, it's a, an attempt to pre-estimate the secondary obligation. Correct. Right. And so it's not a contractual obligation to pay a particular sum of money. It's rather an obligation to pay damages and the contract has liquidated the 
amount of damages you pay. So if I am in breach of my contract because I haven't discharged my cargo in three days, I have to pay the ship owner damages for lot their inability to use the Can ship. Can I just say... Liquidated that sum. Breaking it, news. We've got a winner on the quiz. We've Somebody has sent the correct answer in, and I think this is the first one. It is... Uh, ben saying no, no, no. no, no. no. Stop. Ben says Stop. no. Just okay, start. all right, I'm not going to say it. Okay. Case study, we'll go back to that. Case study. Okay. Ben's case study, case study. Something. Put the case study up. Right, sorry, cut that. Put the case study up. Right, the case study is this. Um, we've got an insurance company, Hyper Risk. They insure the trendy bar against business interruption caused by a notifiable disease up to £1 million. Now, trendy closed down for six weeks during the first lockdown and as a result, lost 100,000. Hyper-risk refused to pay out, denying COVID-19 is a notifiable disease. As a result, Trendy can it, cannot invest to make the bar COVID secure. That means the bar has to remain closed, causing further losses of 900,000. Now, the FCA test case comes out. I hope you see what we're doing here, uh, viewers. We're combining a number of topics in one. <laughs> Uh, after the FCA test case comes out, the insurance company accept they're liable for the 100000 but refuse to pay the full million. And the question is, can Trendy Bar claim for the full million or just 100000 Who should we go to first? Claudia, what do you say? Well, I think that their failure to pay 100000 is not a breach of contract. Right. So their obligation is to indemnify the bar. They that that meant that they were supposed to have paid 100,000 for the first lockdown. If as a result of their failure to do that, then the bar couldn't operate later. Then there may be a causal question under the insurance policy as whether you can say the loss was caused by COVID, etc. But I don't think they could say that the failure to pay the money was an actionable breach and that the 900,000 represent damages for breach they're either recoverable or not on the construction of the insurance policy does that make sense i think that's right yeah and, Jen, and on that? yeah i think that's right i mean the 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 hundred thousand is, is damages isn't it um it, the, yeah. the the obligation that the insurer has, right. has breached is a failure to hold um, trendy bar harmless from 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 the loss and so unless you could show a direct causal link so that it's just a cover it it's a it's a covered loss the second part of the loss then it would just it would be damages for failure to pay damages and and, and you can't you can't have that uh except Paul, is this a trick question to check whether we all keep You're up? such a... I know what you're going to say now. You're such what? a swap, Poonam. Go on, go on. What? What? Yeah, I mean, the answer was... No so one reads statute anymore. <laughs> OK, well, actually, the reason I know... OK, so people, everyone's answer oh, boy. right if you're really old. Um, but if you're young and you know about developments in the world, we have this thing called the Insurance Act 2015 that came into force in 2017 about which I think there's been one decided case, and that too only in Scotland. But I will tell you why I'm so knowledgeable about this in a minute. Um, um, Section 13A of that Act uh, reverses the common law previous position, and it basically says that um, you can get, it's a breach of the insurance contract to fail to pay a claim within a reasonable time of it being made. So now you could seek to claim damages for the breach for failing to pay within a reasonable time, but what's a reasonable time? That must depend on all the circumstances, right, Paul? Well, yeah, so that's a statutory reversal of, was it Sprung and Royal Insurance and those cases about... So, yeah, so I don't know, it's interesting, is it? Would it be reasonable for an insurer to say, well... We're waiting for the outcome of the test case, for example. Well, this, they said they denied cover on the basis that COVID wasn't a notifiable disease. And that's not a reasonable basis to deny. Yeah, that was... But then there's a question as to oh. whether, whether... Oh, no, hold on, guys. Because it wasn't a notifiable disease. 
when the policy was then to do blah, blah, blah. And that point went all the way to the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong during the SARS disease. So I don't think it's unreasonable to take that point. Does, anyway. does, um, does time to investigate include time to run a test case up to the Supreme Court? <laughs> oh, so there's another Supreme Court case about damages, um, payment mistake, and this is kind of an issue on limitation periods about whether or not a mistake of law is reasonably discoverable is it when there is a final judgment by the court of appeal or because we have a declaratory theory of law right so whatever they said in the fca test case is what has always been the law so Um, the reason could you okay let me just ask this and then we'll wind up but if say for example the policy said liquidated losses at ten thousand a day for for the time that the bar is closed could they run a sort of like an eternal bliss argument and say, well, the first 100,000, that was 10 days closure, and that the other is, is still losses we've suffered from COVID. So we sort of get this other head of loss. No, well, it depends, right? Because as I understood the question, you could open in the, the, the period that they've suffered this further loss, you could open, but you had to have procedures in place to make you COVID secure and it was because they were impecunious from the first loss that they couldn't do that. So it's not COVID that's caused their loss, the, the original breach. Is that, is that what you're getting at, Paul? It's it's it's, yeah, it's just, uh, as to whether there's a, to get because section 13A is quite imprecise, isn't it, as to what actually the position will be, what's reasonable. But I just wonder whether there's another way of getting there using this development of um liquidated yes, damage anyway. No. Anyway, so we um, never on I can us tell you. Wrong, that we, is that right? Sorry. I said, are we closing on us telling Paul he's wrong <laughs> after Paul? I'm saying- always right. I'm always right. <laughs> I do the quiz answer because I have no clue what any the of quiz that answer. Happened. And we do have a winner. I was right before. I don't know why I was. I was told to that, stop. That was Ben, who is amazing at many things i think he was trying to win the champagne for himself yeah he, he ben says he, he guessed it um so this is emmanuel michalakakis um in edinburgh i won't give the full address um but congratulations emmanuel it, that name rings a bell punam uh yes well done emmanuel uh emmanuel was the winner of our inaugural quadrant chambers virtual speed moot that we held two weeks ago um, which I judged, um, and Emmanuel did very well then. You're being a bit keen, Emmanuel, and what is the answer to this quiz now? But let me just tell you, oh. let me just go through the answer. So you've got um, Dennis uh, strackwell He is an Argentinian player, played for Everton. Um, in the top right is the sea by flower, which is the uh, national flower of Argentina, and July 1816 <laughs> was when Argentina was founded. And in the eternal bliss, the shipment was coming from Argentina. Argentina to China. And Very Argentine good. is in paragraph 10 of that judgment. So well done. Well done, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Very good. Well done. Very well good. Well done. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Now, uh, a lot of people say to me, Paul, how can we thank you and the Quadcast team for the wonderful entertainment you give us every Thursday? And I know a lot of people out there watching this are thinking, how can, we, how can we express our thanks? I'll tell you how you can. You need to subscribe to the Quadrant Chambers YouTube channel. You need to get on that button. And if you're not signed up for and signed in, sign up and sign in and subscribe. We have just gone through 500 subscribers, which is a real milestone uh, for us, but we need many, many more. And if you do subscribe... Uh, you will get notifications of Quadcast and the other webinars and events that we put on uh, in the Quadrant Chambers YouTube channel. So please, please subscribe. The next episode is we're looking at uh, economic talks, aren't we? And the uh, conspiracy. Do you want to just remind us what we're looking at next week? (laughs) Yeah, it's conspiracy and confidential information we're looking at. I don't remember because I know I vetoed it and said I really didn't want to do whatever we're doing next week, so I can't remember what. What do we do? But it'll be good. All awful means conspiracy. But but the most exciting thing is something really different happening next week, isn't it, Paul? Do you remember that? We we've decided uh, to. I think somebody's substituting out, aren't they? Because they've got work to do. Joe Sullivan. So it's going to be me and three women. Oh man. 
<laughs> Go easy <laughs> on me. Our producer is finally coming out of the shadows to the forefront. We don't need to have Joe talking about football. We're going to have a women powerhouse. We are all incredibly excited. We need lots of viewers, so she's even more terrified than she already is, because that we, would be fun. Yes. We are so diverse. It's untrue. Uh, <laughs> but go easy on me, won't you, all of you? Right, OK, so um, subscribe. Next episode, that leaves it for me to say thank you to the team. Uh, as always, thank you to Emily Saunderson, our producer, will be on screen next week. And thank you to Ben Jacobs, Fisheye Productions, for doing the live streaming services. Uh, until next week, goodbye.